Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Optimo Pathfinder is the next generation of financial modeling. Designed specifically for Australian financial advisors, Pathfinder allows you to develop and compare multiple financial strategies within minutes. With cutting-edge optimization and built-in legislation, it removes the burden of time-consuming modeling and report creation. Easy to use and easy to understand. It saves hours of manual work and allows you to turn around financial strategies in a fraction of the time. Take your business to the next level with Optimo Pathfinder. Hello and welcome to this topic series on delivering advice differently. My name is Fraser Jack and in this podcast episode number two of five, we cover separating a strategy from product, uh, from a sales-based um, industry to professional advice as a product and how the stakeholders or all of the stakeholders from the regulators to advisors and clients are benefiting from this approach. Uh, sitting back and appreciating how far we've come was really rewarding and worth highlighting. So put your feet up and enjoy this episode. Thanks for joining me again, Ben. Thanks, Razor. Feels like forever since we last spoke. There you go. It was, it was a whole episode ago. Uh, now we uh, in this particular episode we're talking about um, you know separating strategy from product and uh, and I guess that really starts with the concept of creating an advice process that is consumer led. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment about the outcomes of financial advice rather than the inputs into financial advice. And so when you look at the advice process and what you're trying to do with a client, you're trying to help them understand their goals and objectives. You're trying to un help them understand their financial position. You're trying to help them understand how they can put strategies in place to meet their goals and objectives and improve their financial position and get the right kind of outcomes for their life. When you talk to members, when you talk to financial planners, what they'll consistently say is 90% of what they do is helping clients go through that process, how they define their goals, how they define their objectives, how they trade off between them, how they create strategies to help them achieve them. The very last 10%, and, and often it's less than that, is which actual products do we use to implement those strategies um, so that the clients can achieve their goals and objectives. And so from that perspective, there's a real separation of the the financial planning service that the client, that the financial planner is providing. There is a real separation of the strategies that help the client achieve their goals and objectives and a real separation of the products that are used ultimately as just a tool, a mechanism for implementing those strategies. Yeah, it certainly feels like the ship sort of turned over over time from being, you know, product sales to, as you mentioned in the previous episode, you know, getting into the, the, the advice as a product, but it's sort of, you know, it's turned to that strategy and understanding and, uh, and you know, all those other things around the process of discovery and relationship and, and, and everything around that. But, um, you know, obviously with the outcomes based that you mentioned earlier, that's sort of, that's really around the idea that none of this actually happens if clients don't engage uh, and be part of this and then put these strategies and therefore some products in place to make this actually happen. Yeah, that's right. And we were, you know, we were talking about the tension between the services that a professional financial planner provides to their clients and the laws and regulations that licensees kind of have to force us into complying with um, from 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 their side of things and the tension that that creates. It's a tension that that FBA members have been trying to deal with and straddle for for many many years, and I think you you saw a lot of them set up their own licensees or, or move to licensees who had a much 
bigger focus on on the client, a much bigger focus on things like goals based advice and and outcomes based um, advice services rather than selling financial products. And and that was a natural place for professional financial planners who believed in this. The client is the center of what I'm doing, not the products I'm selling. Um, naturally gravitated towards. Yeah, it certainly makes sense to me if, if I'm if I put a, my hat on to think of maybe how the regulators would think about that too. That if you're putting the client first, you're a lot um, you're in a lot better position to be you know doing what's right for the regulators if you're starting with the client rather than starting with um, the product. But what, what I wanted to get into is with strategy. A lot of the time, strategy then requires education and explanation, and uh, and that's the the part of the. Um, and you mentioned the, you know, the, the advice process in the future will look very different, but that's the sort of part that, um, we really want to try and capture as part of the advice process or capture as the product that is financial advice, that explanation of how things work, that explanation of the strategy. And, and we'll get to understanding a bit later in the, in the series, but that them coming along for the journey and, and being able to say, no, I, I get that. I understand that or I've learned that or I've increased my knowledge around that strategy. So now I, now I'm happy to proceed with it. Yeah. And I think the challenge for most planners is that's what they do with the client and in front of the client um, and and they co-create their advice they co-create the education they co-create the the strategy recommendations with the client and uh, they'll spend a lot of time doing that and spend a lot of time making sure the client understands but traditionally, we haven't really recorded that part of the process. We might record file notes and we say we educated the client and the client understood, but we don't go into a lot of the detail. And we don't, we generally don't provide that to the client as part of the, the toolkit of information that we give to the client at the other end. We might leave them with fact sheets or we might send them web links about salary sacrifice or about how superannuation works or about how life insurance works. But what we don't usually provide is a recording of that education process. And I think that's a missed opportunity and something that the financial planners should should definitely start thinking about. Um, and, you know, this is where you know, the concept of recording meetings starts to, to take on a whole different level, um, be it recording the audio, but, but probably more recording video, whether it's live in person or using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever technology you're using um, to, to virtually meet with your clients, recording those and then providing a copy of that to the client. You don't need file notes if you're doing that. You may not need a statement of advice, a separate statement of advice if you are doing that. Yeah, separate uh, document. Um, now, it's it's fair to say that most people, or I, I reckon 100% of people who are listening to this podcast would understand how to perform online uh, online meetings or online video and have a webcam attached and, and um, a microphone or some description set up to their, their system. Um, it has become the norm during COVID. <laughs> yeah, I really like the way you sort of uh, mentioned with regards to that one-way recording um, in an SOA that the SOA has traditionally just been uh, here is what I recommend you do. Here is the strategy that here is how it works. And it's kind of like a one way broadcast as opposed to the two way conversation. I'm not saying that planners don't have the two way conversation. I'm just saying that the actual um, advice process and documentation has all been set up about a one way broadcast versus a two way, um, a two way capturing of the conversation. Yeah, that's right. And, and again, it's uh, outcome of the way that we document the statement of advice is on paper and therefore you can't reflect that live engaging conversation in that document uh, and so a couple of years ago the fpa released the future of the soa report and we started to encourage our members to deliver advice digitally where you can start to with these components you can if you record the meeting because you are doing virtual meetings or even if you're sitting in the office and you record with the client you can actually put that into the the financial plan that you provide to the client and if clients can look back at the conversation they had they go oh yeah i remember having that conversation whereas if they read it on a page they don't necessarily have that same recall and you know obviously you mentioned technology being a great 
lead into that. And I want to sort of mention that when there's the sort of two to three reasons why most of us should be embracing technology, obviously, you know, the, the top two efficiencies uh, and effectiveness of the process are the ones. And then there's the third one that you and I uh, um, subscribe to, which is just we like geeking out about it and feel makes us feel good inside to uh, to be playing with new technology. Um, but if we, cut, if we focus on the efficiencies and effectiveness piece, obviously we're looking at, you know, using technology in a way that's efficient and effective within the process. I just want to also cover off on the concept of what you're talking about with recording meetings. Does that require a huge amount of, of, of technology products that we don't already have? Generally, no. I mean, most of us are set up with a camera on our laptops or a, or a camera with our computer, or we, we buy a cheap Logitech or whatever brand uh, camera that we attach to our computer. Uh, most of us have, have, um, headphones or earphones that have microphones attached to them or we buy a separate you can buy a separate microphone if you need something better and so effectively we've got the technology that we're using anyway uh in to record the meetings um that we're having with our clients all you need to do is ask their permission to record it and then find a secure way to to provide that back to them so they've got a copy of it um, if they want to go back and have a listen or or, or have a look at, at what was being discussed. So it's fairly simple and I think we're all, again, getting back to the COVID issue, we're all, we're all kind of used to doing it because we've been operating this way for large parts of the last two to three years. Yeah, fantastic. So anything that can uh, go produce an online meeting, uh, the ability to share screens, the ability to record, and the and the ability to save the file and and uh, and send it through to the client. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Ben, for being part of this particular episode. We were sort of talking about strategy and the versus product, but I look forward to chatting to you in the next episode where we get stuck into um, visuals and 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 finding ways to engage the client. Thank you, Fraser. It's good to be here today. Welcome to this episode two and our five part series. And in this particular episode, we're talking about strategy uh, and product and, and specifically separating the two and making them completely different parts of the process, uh, essentially for the client's uh, purpose. Uh, welcome back, uh, Prashant and Michelle. Um, Prashant, tell us about your uh, advice process and how you separate strategy from product conversations. So in terms of our process, uh, because we have a 100% online service delivery, uh, we start off with a, a sort of a trial phase. This is where you know um, the your prospect at that stage engages with you three times um, in short burst meetings um, over a 21 day period or once every week. And in that journey, you're discovering their personal, their financial, and then you're, you're sort of proposing a, a solution of how you're going to tackle this. And quite often we have a, um, a, our belief is that we can't tackle a person's financial solution in, in one go. Um, it, we usually say, we're going to do this, but we're going to do this over a six to 12 months period. So we sort of stretch it. Um, um, so we're sort of making sure we're solving one thing at a time, you know. So the first, so once they become a paid um, member, as we call them, uh, once they become a paid uh, client, um, then the first thing we start doing is the co-creation of the strategy. So in that first month, we start with purely discussing the financial modeling elements. Product's not even in that picture, nothing. It's just more, you walked in, you said you want these 10 things, I found three different ways of our teams found three different ways to do this. One's financially awesome, but it'll come at the back of a lot of sacrifices. And one's not that financially awesome, but you you know, you'll yeah, you know, but it'll still work. So us being able to come up with the the three routes, the fastest, quickest, and the easiest, you know, kind of routes, and and then presenting that to them, I, I is is the first part of the thing of the journey. Uh, we usually find that. It's one iteration. Everyone's really clear with what they're after, and they, interestingly, they pick the non-financially savvy route. You know, they actually usually pick the middle or the the more happier journey kind of thing. Um, occasionally, it goes to a second iteration, but we we're happy to spend more time in this part because this creates the architecture of what we're about to do. Uh, so we'd rather get the architecture right before we start building anything. So 
that's the first part of the journey. And then as we go in the subsequent months, we start sorting out each part of the um, the advice and the products and everything that fits that architecture. So if it's a super, if we're going to solve that problem, it's super is sort of like one room in this architecture. So we're going to make sure it fits that exactly to what it what the client wanted, you know. Yeah, fantastic. So it's, it's, as you mentioned, short burst or as what some people would call scaled advice mm. because you're scaling it down into, into sections. And I really like the concept of six to 12 month plan, mm. um, you know, of putting things in place um, and of obviously having paid members and people that are on a, let's say, retainer. Is, it, is a retainer model the best way of doing that? A subscription model. Yeah. Yes. So we, yeah, we, that's, that's how we're doing it. And what I really like about Prashant's approach there is just the integrity in the process. Like, you know, you're starting with the getting to know the client, their values, their needs, their goals. Then you're moving into the strategy and then product comes after that. And I think that's really, it's like a skeleton. You know, you get the skeleton right and then everything else hangs off that. Yeah. Now, obviously in this process, if, if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm looking at that from the outside in, I'm thinking there's got to be some sort of priorita- prioritization process as in, you know, if you can do scaled uh, but bit by bit piecemeal uh, advice, you've got to then say to the client, you know, we would prioritize this one. How, you know, do you give them an opportunity to, to prioritize as well? Yep, definitely, definitely. So, you know, there's always going to be, you know, for example, if they're walking with 10 things I want and there's always going to be nice to have and must haves, you know, and, and it's about, you know, um, trying to take away from the bottom up rather than top down and then again, giving them the choice, you know, we ideally, every time we try to model it, we try to model everything, uh, you know, and everyone wants their cake and want to eat it too. So, and it's quite normal, but again, giving them that visual and especially this, this blueprint or this uh, modeling stage, you know, we call it the blueprint stage. Uh, this stage is where we give them the choice to take things out. We we prioritize it. They know what their priority is, but when they visually see it, and they make those choices as a as a couple or as an individual. They buying into that commitment. You know, there's a behavioral element to advice, which you know we 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 tend to miss. But when they commit to saying that's okay, I'll wait on that. Um, I think the chance of a, a successful outcome for them is much higher. Yeah, buying into the strategy is obviously a huge piece of this. And you mentioned you give them three options, which is great. I mean, now, Michelle, this is obviously 101, business 101, right? You know, you give people three options and uh, and they will choose the middle one. But the, what, what are your thoughts on with regards to this concept of being able to give three options and, and, and but then also allowing them to take those options and, and, and unpack them? I think that's really important. I mean, the competing priorities and goals is is a difficult thing to, you know, to work through. And, you know, it's like the concept of the jar with you put your big rocks in first and you work out the things that are most important and then fill it with the smaller and smaller things. And, you know, I think being able to give people a number of options and work through those, I think is really an important approach. Yeah, Michelle, the the, the, the strategy essentially is the um, the framework that everything works upon after that. Yeah, absolutely. And part of it is working out, you know, how much can you squeeze out of that to, you know, how many rocks can you fit in the jar once you can really optimise strategy well, you know, you can fit more rocks in the jar for your client. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously strategy is the part that clients need to be, need to understand in today's, uh, you know, world. We need to make sure they've got, you know, informed consent uh, being the words, but you know, tell us about how uh, percent you work through the strategy with a client, and then you know allow them to, as you said before, co-create the the end strategy. Yeah. So when we sort of do the modeling, it again okay, it comes down to the tool that we use and the advisor's familiarity and comfort around doing this. Um, so we. Um, so the tool we use, we don't, we don't shy away from showing it to the car, uh, to a client. We we just you know share screen. We say this is what we you know what have we come down to, come down to sorry, and uh, these are the three options. Now you know we spend probably fifteen to twenty minutes explaining these things, and then we say what would you like to take off? What would you like to change? You know so, and then when they say actually you know what let's not do that or how about instead of putting a thousand dollars a month into this investment how about cutting it back to 500 and instead of saying oh okay i'll go back and come back to you tomorrow we are able you know we tend to do it straight away you know we sort of take that mystique of you know we're trying to make it uh simple is uh, it's almost like you know we sometimes it's like oh 
if, if it's so simple, why am I paying you so much? You know, but we, we try to take that away. Say, no, this is simple. You know, take it away. We give them the answer straight away and then they go, okay. And they're that, it's sort of like build a bear kind of thing, you know, at that point. And, and that's usually the second half of the meeting. They keep trying back and forth and they all then come to terms that, great, this, this actually, uh, you know, is, is exciting. Let's do that. Um, that's how we do it. So, Prashant, how do you find that customers respond in that process? That the the blueprint stage, the modeling stage, is probably the high the peak in our customer experience journey. It's that we, we start. It's almost like we start with a high note, and it's hard for us to finish in that high. You know, after the twelve month period. But now we've sort of find a way to finish that twelve month period in that high note. But we're finding that the highest amount of client engagement because we take feedbacks in a regular frequency and and the. the 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 um you know the excitement they they bring it's so hard to find it in any other pieces of the journey uh, for us it's uh, interesting what we find that's really cool I want to try and throw to uh, the concept that some some advisors would have a fear of you know modeling a software with a client um, just through some of the complexities obviously around maybe the tools that they're using but uh, what are your thoughts on you know the you know, leaning into actually learning the software and being able to use it, um, use it with the client. For us, it's very important. So both Daniel and I invested not a lot of time, but a reasonable amount of time understanding the tool. And of course, the easier it is, the better, you know, whoever builds it. But it's almost like if you want to be a gynecologist and you don't know how to operate an ultrasound, you see what I mean? You've got to invest time on the tools of your trade. Yes, there's all these other people behind the scene to make it better or can do it for you. But I think that this part was too critical for us not to uh, sort of get our hands on. Uh, sure, we have power planning and all the others that fine tune it and, 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 and sort of deliver a better, more smoothened outcome uh, post meeting. But this part was very important. And I think technology is like any relationship. The more time you spend, the better it gets. Yeah, and Michelle, obviously having a, a tool that's easy to use cuts down on the amount of staff and obviously increases the efficiency in the process. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think you've touched on a really good point. It can be quite scary for advisors where, you know, they, they want to engage their clients in that process, but it's a bit scary putting yourself on the spot and making it live. How we've seen advisors have typically done that is they start familiarizing themselves with the software and then they'll run a couple of scenarios. So they might start with a base case do nothing, get no advice. This is what your, you know, your net worth would be at the end. Then they model a couple of scenarios and those things that they've worked through and they feel confident in, then they might anticipate a couple of what if questions the customer would have. And then in the meeting, if they've already got a basis that they've prepared, they know really well, and then that's kind of the icing on the cake. So You're right, Michelle, if you have a couple of um, scenarios where you think somebody might in this situation might be thinking this and therefore we're going to, we're going to answer that prior to, you can actually introduce the conversation if they don't, if they don't bring it up. You can say some people often think this. And so within we go into that and we show them that how that works and it gives them more of an understanding that uh, or, or it certainly appears that you know your way around the software a little bit better than, than you may you know, have the confidence. Yeah, in. and you know, and, and can anticipate their needs. They've raised something in a previous question, previous meeting that was a question or uh, an idea. So, yeah attentive to their needs. Yep. And uh, I also find that as advisors, we tend to underestimate our ability to learn technology. I think we've, to me, when I compare with a lot of other professions, we've adopted this much better than so many other professions. Um, and I think, I think we, you know, um, I think we're doing a great job at this. I think we'll adapt very quickly um, in learning these things. Yeah, now, Prashant, you sort of mentioned the the ongoing conversation because it's not just about providing the advice up front. It's, uh, you know, your model lends itself to, you know, having shorter meetings but more regularly with your members um, and obviously tracking towards their, their outcomes and, 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 you know, changing the scenarios all the time because, you know, people have moved from that where they were three months ago to, a, you know, where they are now. Uh, mm. Tell us about how, you know, you use software in that space to be able to help um, your clients, you know, track towards where they're going, but also recognize how well they've done in the past. Sure. Um, so uh, in terms of the progress, what we find is um, we usually start with five key dimensions to start measuring the, 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 the member at the start of the journey. 
So, you know, like in terms of how they're tracking on an income perspective, debt perspective, savings, we just have five measurable, quantifiable, um, you know, metrics. Uh, we show them where they are. And then at the end of the 12 months, we show them where, you know, how the, how the dials have changed. You know, that's pretty much a before and after. Uh, have you, you started at red, mud, now you're at green, that sort of thing. But where the strategy and everything that we do between the 12 months is, is it, it starts giving us a clear indication of how the dial will start turning. So, uh, you know, for example, by saving this much, you know, um, when we do the modeling, we now how to ration the assets. We know how to ration the cash flow to get to that, you know, you know, shifting the dial. So um, we always take a before and after at different points. And internally, we lo we do that at least three times a year internally, but the client only sees it twice a year, start and the end. Yeah, there's certainly a saying, I think you, would, uh, Michelle, you'll attest to this, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, how important is uh, measuring these types of things in the advice process? Oh, super important. The background to process improvement, particularly if you look at Lean Six Sigma, you you know, first you take a baseline and measure, where are you now? Then you make your changes and you come back and, and measure it again. To, it's absolutely that. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Yep. Now, Prashant, I wanted to quickly ask you um, around, you know, the, we talked about previous, you know, occupations and professions and, and certainly doctors are a great one to model uh, an advice process off, you know, the the concept of, um, you know, the, the doctors, you go in, you, you, you give them all the information, they do tests, they run diagnostics, you know, they then create a, a you know, look at treatment plans, which we could formally talk about as strategies before they talk about medication or product. Um, how do you how do you have that conversation around you know what you what you're doing and how it relates to a sort of a medical um, process? Absolutely. So um, you know, so we uh, interestingly about two years ago we had this opportunity to sit, sit with a couple of doctors and because what uh, to me they have so much more variables to deal with when they look at a patient. There's a hundred million things that could be wrong with this person. How they quickly arrive at the problem point and how they sort of solve it was, was amazing. And I kept probing them in terms of how they do it and things like that. And it just comes down to, you know, it's basically they try to boil it down to what they think is wrong, you know, that, that usually comes with a little bit of experience, but then they order tests to validate it. You know, so it's not like the tests are not there to find what's wrong with you. The tests are there to validate what they think is wrong with you, you know, and it's the usually the opposite of what we think the tests are for. But then after that, they go with once it's validated, then they look at a potential treatment plan, which is customized to your body, I guess, you know. So and I think the way we called this process, that first process where they test you to find a validate, it's called differential diagnosis. That's how they call it. Is there's three, you know, they and and we usually do that. We when we finish that onboarding journey, um, we we decide on what's potentially wrong with them uh, or what's potentially stopping them from uh, achieving this goal. And we incorporate that into the modeling, uh, you know, to sort of say, if we change this one behavior, how does everything change into the future? And showing the client the, the future self, you know, their future self is, is very powerful. Um, and just pointing and boiling it down to that one or two behaviors that could change it from doing nothing versus becoming, you know, having a couple of million dollars to show for and a happy life, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, priceless. Yeah. So that's how we've incorporated uh, that into the process. I just love the way that you use the word, kept probing the doctors. It was uh, until they gave you the information you needed. But uh, but it's a really good point, isn't it? Because sometimes it's behaviours that make a difference to the treatment plan. Um, you know, their their current behaviour is not necessarily financial products. And um, I think that when you were talking or focusing on strategies uh, and modelling with strategies and allowing people to understand the, the consequences of their actions, um, it puts the onus on sometimes their actions more so than just the products. Michelle? And I think it's really important that in this process that they understand the strategies because you could walk away with the best diagnosis and prescription, but if they don't take the pills um, and they don't trust your advice, then it's kind of all a waste of time. So it's really that engagement process, the building trust, the confidence, the educating them in the process that they'll walk away and take on board your advice. Yeah, I think that's uh, very much like your standard uh, coaching one on one isn't it? allow the allow the client to be able to you know come to the conclusion take ownership and, and want to make the changes rather than just sort of telling them what they 
they need to do, at letting them understand that you know these are these are the consequences of their actions, and uh, they they have the opportunity or the choice to change that. Prashant, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us in this episode, number two of our five-part series. We look forward to catching you in the third episode. Jeff, thanks for joining us again in the second episode. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, always good to be on your show, Fraser. Now, now we're talking about uh, strategy uh, and product and certainly the difference between strategy and product and making sure that we keep those two things separate in this, this profession that we're in. Uh, tell us a little bit about your process and what you do around, um, you know, with your conversations with clients when it comes to strategy um, versus or and then product. So I've got I've got several distinct phases. So I have an estate planning process. So that's more or less uh, I use the software that I use to help outline a, a client's current situation. But then then I would then I would sort of describe and describe the outcomes for them and the key things they need to consider so so that so i guess that that one is a little bit easier because i've been doing that for a long time and it, it does come quite automatic where i can see size up the situation quite quickly no matter uh, the scale uh, and and have ebooks and other things which i use as part of that process now i other strategy so I do use uh, a tool where I uh, probably an important tool that I use is I, I'm actually quite I like to look help the clients understand their goals. I don't like the situation where you assume the client knows what their goals are because who knows how much you need for retirement. That has got to be a very unique requirement, and yet um, the whole industry is about you need X dollars for retirement. So. I'm very big on helping the client to understand what their goals are and what life looks like for a retirement, even if even if they're not even retiring. So, and then it's a matter of working backwards, and then filling in the dots for them. And so, say, so that that could take on many different roads. And then the financial advice is all different, depending on what their outcomes are and where they see themselves. So I. I find that I would spend two or three meetings on that side of it rather than sitting there in front of them and filling out a form and writing down what their goals are. Uh, does that make sense, Fraser? <laughs> yeah, so you're co-creating those goals with the client, uh, as in you don't say, what's your goal? You say, if, if for this to happen, do you want it to be here, here, or here? Or are you are you getting deeper into that sort of conversation? What, is, what, is, what does breakfast look like in retirement? Or like how, how deep do you go? How deep? So, as, so really, I, I sort of like it another way. I give them the platform for them to, to fill in the to, – to create their own – life to fill in the chapters of their life i don't tell them what it should look like i just give them the platform and then uh, give them the then i provide them with the tools to help that make to help it to make it happen so so quite often they don't know what is possible and so it's it's about exploring the possibilities and and getting them to lift uh lift their vision or to to look much broader so rather than very narrow and, and a big part of my job is to help them avoid pitfalls and, and making poor choices uh, about the current situation and what they should be aware of uh, in the future. Yeah, and so with those pitfalls, you're obviously pointing those out because often people wouldn't see them coming. Oh, no, no, very rarely, yeah. So it could be – well, the obvious one is not having an estate plan. Is um, The pitfall there is they uh, they get sick or – they might die or something tragic and there's no there's no plan it's just yep. total disarray and their the fa- their life for their family is impacted forever or the worst there's could be fighting disharmony all sorts of issues on that estate planning side yep excellent so, and then by the time you've done that and you you really know them very well and you start then you start talking about you know, get get rid of the pitfalls, sort them out. Let's let's make sure the contingencies are in place. Then look at what the possibilities could be, and then, as you said before, broadening the horizon on what pos- what's possible. That's right. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to plan to a hundred, and then work back. So, and that helps. So it gives the clients a bit better time frame to work in. Um, so the sixty-five may become a seventy-five, 
And that, gives, right. that gives us an opportunity uh, as to what can you do right now to improve your life or to, to help you do what you really want to do in life, not just yep. follow some and track which has been laid out for you by someone else. Right, and then so uh, so you're able to then look at some modelling around that, and then look at and then discuss different strategies with the client that can can assist. Exactly, and that could be even what they're doing for a living, a succession plan for their business, a whole range of different things which you might not not might not otherwise have discussed. Yeah, there's if you if you if where you, they're going to live, for example, could be something like that. Yeah, if you remove product from the conversation altogether, when we talk about strategies, a lot of those strategies could be habits or uh, yeah, yeah, decisions that can be made um, within and around the the family or the relationship or the all sorts of things. How how you know they, where they want to set their goals and their sights. All these all of these things are strategies, I guess. Yes, for sure, and, and also how they use their money. So it, it's not just about. <laughs> Um, slogging it away for 20 years to to have a retirement which someone else says you should be having it's about using that money now to enjoy life and to prepare themselves for a long future yep fantastic and um and as you said before a lot of your you said a couple of meetings what what sort of what would your average meeting process be with uh with a new client yeah so i initially had a a, quite a the initial meeting is quite broad and it's, it's really understanding um, how the client came to be in their position today, what, what's influenced them over their life journey. So that and sort of, you know, try and identify a few gaps. I, I cover five different areas. So that that's an initial 45 minute meeting. And then once they're engaged after that, and then we probably have another four or five meetings. Because you have to remember there's two estate planning meetings in there. So that they're actually proper meetings. So not, I'll send you down the road to the local solicitor type estate planning. So that, that helped. That's why there is so many meetings involved. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly, I'm um, more and more talking to people, the more and more they're spending uh, more time in this initial process with new clients, obviously bringing them on. Uh, and part of that, part of that upfront, which we're not covering today, but is around, you know, setting the expectations of that upfront and letting them know that it's going to be a long process. Does that mean that you have, are, you know, are look, are, are able to sort of look after fewer clients or take on fewer new clients? You know, physically, it's not possible to have uh, lots and lots of clients when you're, uh, when you follow that type of process, because it is very, it's fairly hands-on and it's quite, you're building up quite a, a deep and meaningful relationship with the clients. Yep. Yep. Fair enough. You are, you are looking after a lot of things there for uh, a lot of things to, to get in place at the beginning, but also a lot of things to review, come review time. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for catching up in this particular episode, episode two. Uh, we look forward to catching you in the next episode where we start talking about uh, uh, using visuals for engagement. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Fraser.